Greats, and welcome to another episode of Middle Great Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, Banneker Bones and the Alligator People, and the upcoming untitled third Banneker Bones Adventure, which will hopefully be available for you early next year. Uh, and believe me, when it's available, you, you won't get me to stop talking about it. Uh, it is the story of an 11-year-old biracial boy detective and his cousin who comes to live with him and the hunt for both giant robot bees and then later alligator people. So if you like a fun middle grade book about an 11-year-old who has to deal with monsters, uh, read Malamander. Uh, but after you read that, come back and, and check out Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees if you're curious. Uh, both books are available as paperbacks and the ebook. Uh, for Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees is free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Uh, if you're joining us internationally, which I'm uh, thrilled to see uh, every week is more and more of you. Uh, hello, Australia. Hello, Great Britain. Uh, hello, all of you wonderful international folks. It's available for you as well. Don't 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 feel left out. Uh, you can get a copy uh, wherever ebooks are sold in your country. Uh, do a search for Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. You can check that out. Uh, under the super secret pen name Robert Kent, I've written some uh, horror novels for older readers, such as the young adult novel All Together Now a Zombie Story, and All Right Now a Short Zombie Story. If you like your zombies slow, uh, if you like your protagonists desperate and uh, occasionally humorous, but otherwise terrified for their lives, if you like The Walking Dead, you're going to like All Together Now a Zombie Story. Uh, if you want to move past that young adult bracket and go straight to adult horror, uh, you can check out my five-volume serial novel, The Book of David. Uh, that is a horror story about an atheist who buys a haunted house that then begins to give him religious visions involving flying saucers. Lots of fun. Uh, it's intentionally written in the style of Stephen King. If you're a fan, if you're curious, you can check out the first of five chapters. Each uh, serial installment is called a chapter, even though the fifth chapter is the longest book I've written. Uh, chapter one of the Book of David by Robert Kent is also available to download as an ebook for free whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Uh, coming up on the show, our cup runneth over. Uh, we've got nothing but great guests lined up, including uh, today. Uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, authors Annie Sullivan and John Claude Bemis. We're going to be talking with public relations expert Claire McKinney, uh, plus plenty of other authors and publishing professionals yet to be announced. Uh, if you're curious to keep up with the show, you can read our guest list anytime at middlegradeninja.com. There are also hundreds of interviews uh, with authors and with literary agents that are written, so you won't be able to listen to them. But if you don't mind doing a little bit of reading when you're learning about books and authors, uh, check out middlegradeninja.com. We'll get you set. Uh, today, my guest is the esteemed Thomas Taylor. Uh, Thomas, thanks so much for uh, joining me today. How are you? Hi, Rob. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm, I'm very well, thanks. I hope you are too. I am having a wonderful writing day. I've spent my morning, I'm on about my fifth cup of coffee, uh, but I, I, my, uh, I exceeded my word count that I was hoping for, and I'm very thrilled with how the drafting came, so oh, good. You, can't, you can't do much better for a morning than that. No, five cups of coffee for a morning, that's pretty good going. That must have really fuel your writing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a little shaky there, by the, <laughs> but that's what revision's for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> to remove the caffeine jitters, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, Thomas, tell uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, give a steamed audience just kind of an overview of your background. Uh, yes, well, I'm a, an author and an illustrator of children's books, although I, I did begin out as, a, as an illustrator. I went to art school. Um, I started off illustrating picture books primarily, but discovered that uh, I enjoyed writing, mainly by starting to write picture books for myself. They're quite, quite short texts, but I found that I enjoyed the process of writing more and more. And got drawn further and further into it um, until eventually took a stab at trying to write uh, older fiction, uh, fiction for older children. Um, yeah, and it's been quite a quite a bumpy road. I've had a few books published, and now my new book, Mal Malamander, is, is, um, has had a great success so far in the UK and is about to be launched in, in the US. And, uh, yeah, it's easily my most successful book to date. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, um, but the new prospects open before me. Well, I have uh, just finished it this week. I am absolutely in love with this book, and I have no doubt it's going to be a huge success. Oh, thank uh, you. 
So I predict it will be the most successful book ever launched in the United States. We'll see. <laughs> but I, I think it's going to do very well. <laughs> I'll join you with that happy prediction, but I won't hold my breath. <laughs> I wanted to ask you something I, I saw when I was stalking you online that always fascinates me when I come across this. Uh, as you said that reading did not come easily to you as a child. Is that right? Yes, I think that's that's correct. Yes, I had trouble reading. I was slow to learn to write. I suppose I I, um, I was never diagnosed as dyslexic, but I always had a problem where my eyesight would tend to come off the off the written line. It would come off the ink and go down the white the white passages between the letters a little bit. So I used to find reading was quite slippery. I, I had a lot of trouble, and I, it put me off trying. Um, but I had very supportive parents. My grandmother was a librarian and she um, brought books all the time. And then it just suddenly clicked that even though I had to make a bit of an effort to keep my eye on the online, uh, when I discovered what was in the book was worth reading, I, I, uh, I, I became quite a voracious reader. Um, but I think I came to it quite late. So I, I, I was probably around the age of about 12, I think, when I read The Hobbit. By Tolkien for the first time, and uh, that was probably the biggest book I'd written, uh, I'd read until that point, and just suddenly discovered just how vast and and uh, all, all encompassing a novel could be. I never really looked back from there, but it could easily have gone the other way because reading wasn't very easy. I could easily have just decided I wouldn't bother and and and, uh, and do something else. But uh, yeah, yeah, reading has not come naturally as a child. It's a uh, it's a goal of mine to. I uh, always keep these conversations kind of fun and professional. I never want to ask somebody, tell me your, your deepest, saddest secret, and then try <laughs> and proceed to get them to cry. Um, so when I ask you about your, your childhood, like, for example, I was terrible at singing, but I wouldn't bring that up because I'm still terrible at singing, <laughs> despite <laughs> a great deal of effort to improve. Um, but when I'm talking with somebody who did grow up to become an author of note, that's interesting because I want to know where that uh turned around for you you said it was 12 when you're reading the hobbit so do you remember what it was about tolkien specifically that brought you in is there anything from that time that you bring to your writing for modern reluctant readers uh that's an interesting question i think i i just loved the 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 fantasy and the escape of being able to go into another world and i've always been drawn to um fantasy fiction or fiction that involves another world or a place to go to um but I mean, the Hobbit, the Hobbit, um, even even the book I'm writing now, I'm writing the sequel to, to Malamanda. I've got my own secret writing, which is very like like runic in that book, and I've deliberately been I've been inspired to do that by by the Hobbit, by because of of, of the runes in the Hobbit, and I want my own my own version of that. And uh, and of course, I love to draw a map in my book, and again, again, you know, Tolkien's famous for his maps, so. Um, I think there are certain books that you read at a certain time of your life that stick with you, like the um, stories of Sherlock Holmes, for example. Uh, I read those shortly afterwards, and of course they they sort of tend to float around and inform everything else you do from there on. And uh, um, I think it's the things you read and, and 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 enjoy when you're around that middle grade age that are the things that really stick with you, which is probably why a writing for middle grade is such a an exciting prospect. You can play a party that add up for somebody else. It's uh, it's pretty exciting. What is it uh, about writing for children that 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 most appeals to you? Well, I think it's just that really. It's the fact that um, you can. I, I want to open that up for other people in the way it was opened up for me. And also, I just feel that when you write for children, you can write a big open world, and you can write about hope, and you can write about things that maybe. For an adult audience, you have to sort of wind back on because adults expect, I think they, adults tend to reward cynicism and tend to be world weary and maybe aren't going to accept some of the things. But children, you know, they, their minds are open, they're curious, the world is wonderful. And I think it's good to, to teach children that the world is big and to be explored and um, that being curious is good, being kind is good, and that hope is, is something to, to aspire to. And so it is very exciting to write for. Um, uh, to write for that age and having written i had written a ya novel and it, it was the same but it was just slightly crimped i had to to make the ya tone i just felt like i was shrinking things a little somehow i can't really explain it better than that and then when i went back to writing middle grade again it just everything tends to become expansive once more so 
I don't know quite what I mean, but I think I know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about uh, hauntings, right? As your young, young haunters, adult novel? Yes, haunters. Yes, that's right. That was my, um, yes, that was a, a YA novel I wrote, um, which was published in the US as well. Uh, ooh, when was that? 2012. Um, and I still hear about it. People still write to me about it. I still occasionally hear from people who, who really loved it and want to know why there isn't a sequel and everything. And uh, um, what can I say? You know, I, I, I'm not sure the YA tone really suits me. Uh, that's part of the answer. I think middle grade, that nine to 12 slot is, is just, it just feels right for me to write for that. And I'm kind of curious because uh, one reason uh, that I uh, write partially for older readers uh, is because I feel that I can expand a little bit more. Um, I think the Book of David all told was like 280,000 words or something insane oh, that wow, you could wow. never do for middle grade. Um, That's so huge. It, it's expanded. <laughs> um, so what is it that uh, about that 9 to 12 range that allows you to expand that, that young adult doesn't? I think I, I mean I I say this and I don't really know because I haven't I haven't written adult novels I haven't written so I don't really have the comparison but I just feel as if um, w when I was twelve or ten I I was prepared for anything I was prepared to believe anything whereas now as an adult I'm a lot more circumspect and skeptical and um, I just feel that a child can accept I don't want to give any spoilers about Malamanda but some of the twists and turns, I think, that have thrown a few adults. I've had people get in touch and say, why did you do that? That didn't seem quite right. But I just think children can go with that. And somehow um, um, that allows you to do a lot more. But, I mean, I could be wrong about that because, um, as I said, I've never actually written, I, I've never written a adult crime fiction or anything, for example. So perhaps I'm wrong. But uh, that's how it seems to me anyway. No, I think that makes perfect sense, especially for those of you uh, watching or listening who haven't. Uh, Red Malamander, when those twists come. Uh, but really, even from the beginning, we're going to talk about the, the book in depth here. Um, but um, it uh, sort of takes it uh, just straight away that you're going to suspend your disbelief. There's never any question in the narrator's mind that, hey, we're going to start crazy and just get crazier. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that moment when I don't want to say what happens when the cat does something that is, I think, a bit surprising. I don't want to give it away. And um, I didn't know the cat was going to do that until the cat did that in the book. And, and I had a slight sort of um, slight, slight goosebumps when I, when I wrote what happened. I thought, wow, I, I, that's strange. And that's, but I really like this. And I kept it in. And I've had several children write to me on, on, and get in touch and say they just love the cat. They, they love Erwin, the cat, and what happens and everything. But I've also had a few adults contact me on Twitter and say, couldn't really understand why that happened. Didn't seem to fit in. And I just thought, well... Maybe not, but uh, <laughs> I think it's, a, it's a magical moment that that, that threw that took me by surprise, and I think it's um, um, I think it I think children like that moment very much. You know, we're talking about a, a book with a mer monkey, among other things. So, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. If you're going to get to that point and say, "Well, this was where it got unrealistic for yeah. me," <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. While we're uh, talking about belief, uh, regular esteemed uh, audience members know that I have to ask you, so let's just go ahead and get it out of the way. Uh, Thomas Taylor, have you ever seen a flying saucer, and do you believe in them? I, I've i seen uh, UFOs in that I've seen things I couldn't explain in the sky, but none of them were saucer-shaped yet. So um, the literal answer is I haven't quite seen a saucer, but uh, uh, do I believe we're being visited by extraterrestrials right now? I, I don't know, but um, I'll try and keep open-minded about that. But I've never seen anything that's led me to believe in it yet. But I do look at the sky all the time. I am quite interested in, the, in that kind of thing. So I, I am a bit of a sky watcher. And I live by the sea, so I get very dark skies. If I look out over the sea, I can see a lot of uh, stars. And uh, I'm always on the lookout for something that might be moving in, the, in a way that's a bit surprising. Well, that's where they'd be, right? Far well, yeah. out there uh, over the ocean where the uh, they're not going to be bothered by us here on the mainland. No. We're well, in a sure. prime spot. Do you, do you um, how about you? Do you, have you seen, have you seen something like that? I have not, but I uh, have people close to me who have, and I believe them. Okay. Excellent. So from, the, from the time I was young, my, my, my grandmother saw one and she, her story was convincing enough that I said, oh, this is, this isn't something that grandma's making up. This really happened. 
Now, could I take from her story that absolutely it was an extraterrestrial civilization coming to visit us? No, but something very creepy uh, buzzed up along her car. And you can see when she oh, told no. her story, um, how, how nervous she got with this bright light that I guess had followed her for a couple of miles. She ended up getting a speeding ticket. Uh, it was one of the first ones uh, she she. Well, my mother didn't, or my grandmother didn't speed. Uh, so it was one of the first tickets she ever got. And so part of me has always suspected maybe that was just a story for grandpa to explain how she got a speeding <laughs> ticket. Was, uh, was she was worried about the flying saucer. But then when she would tell it, her, her face would change and become very serious. And I could tell, no, this is something that happened. You could see she was very frightened still. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a, an aunt I've talked about who, who saw one as well, who was a science teacher. And it really irritated her that she saw it. And that there were other witnesses with her, because I think if she'd been alone, she would never have told us. Uh, but because there were other witnesses from the family that talked about it, she had to admit that, yes, she was there. But she'd be annoyed when I talked to her about that, because she's like, I'm forever trying to talk to you about science, Rob. I'm forever trying to tell you real things. And all you ever want to ask me about is the stupid flying saucer I saw. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. These are good stories. I mean, they're, they're good anecdotes. I think it's important to listen to someone's anecdote, even if you're not sure what the truth of it is. I think... Um, some of them can be quite compelling, can't they? Well, the other caveat that I always put out there when we when we talk about this is that um, I have to admit that I want it to be true. Uh, if you could prove to me that it absolutely wasn't true, I wouldn't want you to because I like living in a world where that's possible. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm sure there is someone out there. It's just whether or not they're they're also here is is the bit I'm I'm a bit hung up on. But uh, I'm sure if we could travel far enough, we would. There, there are there are people out there. I'm sure. Yeah, it fills me with hope that maybe one day we'll get invited to join the Galactic Federation. They'll already have stuff figured out so we don't have to worry so much ourselves. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Where do I sign up? <laughs> and since it's you and I'm talking to the author of Hauntings, I'm going to follow this question up with uh, an unusual question I don't usually ask, which is, do you believe in ghosts and have you seen one of those? I, I think when I was a child, I would have, if you'd asked me when I was that 12 year old reading The Hobbit, I think I would have told you I had seen one. But um, looking back, I, I, I'm not so sure. But um, again, I keep an open mind. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly willing to be to be convinced. But looking back, I think I, I had an overactive imagination. And I'm not sure I really, really can say that I did. I certainly don't have a good ghost story to tell. Although lots of people in my family have um, really quite compelling stories um again great stories don't know if it's true or not but um i tend to just keep an open mind on everything and uh and hope to experience it for myself i think when it's something extraordinary it does help if you've had the personal experience um I find it hard to make that jump without without experiencing something myself I think even if I had a, a close encounter or a supernatural event, neither of which, uh, not a ghost anyway, uh, have happened to me, um, I think even then I'd be doubting myself because I'd, I'd be doing Occam's Razor, which what's more likely that this thing happened or that a writer uh, saw something that's a little bit unusual? <laughs> that oh, yeah. Yeah. There. yeah, we are, after all, professional liars in a, in a way, aren't we? We make up, up everything we do. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> But, and um, I don't lie to anybody as well as I lie to myself. Yeah, well, so. <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's uh, let's just jump right into Mal and Mandy. But before I can do that, you and I both know that I can't run a middle grade theme podcast and not ask you at least a little bit about the cover for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So I promise to be brief, but oh, that you designed the the cover. Uh, it was your what your first professional commission, and it's something I saw you'd said about it was that it was an image that is as much uh, something for you to live down as it is something to be proud of. So, what has that experience been like for you? Yes, well, just to uh, briefly explain, I I, um, I did the cover art for the UK edition of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, and it was my first job out of out of art school. So it was ninety six. That would have been it was published in ninety seven. And I left art school in 95. So it was, for me at the time, it just meant my first professional job. I had landed this job. I had to do it professionally. I had to deliver it, get it get it handed in and um, and, and hit the right uh, professional standards. So that I was preoccupied with that. Um, had no idea the book was going to be super successful or, or go on to be mega successful. I mean, over, incredibly successful. I had no idea about that. So 
it took me by surprise um, that this first job I did, um, even though I obviously I didn't write the book, I just did the cover up. But it, it, that cover image just seemed to um, travel on far beyond where everything else in my career was, and uh, it seemed to overshadow everything. And um, and even now, I mean, I still get a lot of contact from people about it. And um, just today, I've been in touch with a collector who, who you know in touch to see if I've got anything left over from that time I'd like to sell. Uh, will I you know, sign things? And I get a lot of that. And and for a long time, I just found it, it was in the way, it got in the way of my active career. Um, but over the last few years, I've, I've, I think I've made peace with it. And I've just found a way to live with that running concurrently. Cause it's, it's, it is an important thread in, in my career. And it's a, it's a great line on my, on my, uh, my resume, it's it's an important thing that I, um, but it's taken me a long time to sort of come to terms with it um, because I can't even paint that way anymore. I don't even work like that anymore. So it feels almost like someone else has done it. And yet I still get uh, contact from people who 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 only only want to talk to me about that and who um, are amazed to hear I've written other things or done other things. Uh, and I think when you have a career where something stands out and it's just way 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 off the scale compared to everything else, that can be a very imbalanced career especially over time and and um yeah it's taken me a bit of time to 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 find a way to live with it if, if you see what i mean i think that's what i meant in that line that you uh, that you quoted so it seems like both something wonderful to have happened and um but when i read your essay i was like oh that that makes me feel almost bad that you you would have gone in thinking oh this is just a job um, because I'm assuming that that when you when you when you held the manuscript, it it didn't glow. Or there wasn't like a soft, eerie noise that accompanied it. <laughs> no, and in fact, um, I uh, I I mean, I feel stupid because I had I had the manuscript a year ahead of the book being published. It was a version that was still being edited by the author and the publisher, so I had an early version of it. It was printed out. I had it in paper. Um, chapter eleven was missing because the author was 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 revising it. I read it and I enjoyed it. And then I did the picture and then I threw away the manuscript because I finished the job and it was just this big stack of paper that was in the way. And I didn't really keep much. I mean, I kept a few things, but uh, that manuscript would probably have some worth now or certainly some interest to a, a Harry Potter collector to see how it differs from the final um, text. But um, yeah, I mean, I had no idea that it was going to be um, such a big deal. So uh uh, if I had known, I mean, I, maybe I would have been too intimidated to do the work. I don't know. I think it was my first job, perhaps. But um, um, and it was a different time. It was an analog time, I and mean, it was all painted and then taken by hand. I took it in personally to hand it into the publisher because it was my first piece. I wanted to make sure it got there safely. Um, there was no digital element at all. It was um, just a painting. Whereas now, of course, I would work. I use a lot of Photoshop, and uh, it's a very different process now. It's a different world back then. Ninety six, a different planet. Yeah, practically. I mean, heck, ninety six. Did we? We didn't have cell phones at the point, did we? Uh, I didn't have one, but they were. I remember seeing them, but yeah, I didn't. I personally, I didn't have one until about two thousand, I think. So. Uh, then it probably been like those uh, Michael Douglas and Wall Street giant half a helmet phones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Well, that's it. I uh, I promised a couple of people that I told I was going to talk to you, like, I will ask him about it. But by golly, we're going to talk about Malamender because I am absolutely <laughs> in love with this book. Uh, so for the uninitiated, for those who haven't already read it a uh, hundred times at this point, if you wouldn't mind giving just a brief summary about what the book's about. Yes, so the book is set in a fictional seaside town um, in the UK, but I've left it deliberately vague. So hopefully you could imagine it wherever you wherever you want, really. Um a fictional seaside town out of season where the tourists have gone and where only a few locals remain and the the weather has has crept in and the mist comes up the beach and uh, all the attractions all the light things are closed down and uh, and mysteries abound and it's set in um in a hotel called the grand nautilus hotel which is on the seafront and in the basement of the grand nautilus hotel there lives a boy called herbert lemon or herbie to his friends and Herbie is the lost and founder of the Grand Nautilus Hotel. And he is, his job is like a lost property um, attendant, but it's a bit more elaborate than that. He looks after all the lost things that get handed in and he has to try to find a way to get them back to their owners. And one day something very unusual gets handed in to the lost and foundry. In fact, it's not something at all. It's someone, uh, a girl hands herself in 
uh, because she was lost in the hotel 12 years before as a baby and she wants to be found and she wants Herbie to help her. And so they begin this adventure. Um, Herbie's quite reluctant, but he decides to help her. And very soon they get drawn into a local mystery about a creature called the Malamander, which some people say they, they've seen down at low tide on the beach, creeping in the mist. And there's a, a host of characters in the town that they have to interact with and they never quite know who can be trusted and who isn't. And, and the adventure kind of grows from there and um, has many magical elements that... Uh, um, but I think you can you can um, uh, that have all been inspired in some way by my, my own experience of living, or living by the sea and of seaside architecture and I, and, and beach combing and all the things that I've I've learned to love and uh, and and notice um, in my own life. I've tried to bring exaggerated versions of it into the story um, uh, to build it up. And um, yeah, and I hope if readers decide to read it, that they will they will enjoy it. Um, and it's published in the US just in six days' time, on the 9th of September. So, uh, And this will be uh, airing on Tuesday, so it'll be it's five days' time. It's even closer. You could be pre-ordering it right now, a Steam. Yeah, that's yeah. probably, <laughs> already probably in some shops right now. These things to sleep to slip out a bit early, don't they? So, uh, yeah, that's exciting. And um, who, uh, who would you say is the ideal reader for this story? Um, I think the ideal reader is probably... Aim aged between nine and twelve, um, or um, still identifies with nine and twelve. You could be ninety nine and probably still enjoy it if you if you like children's books. Um, and I, and in all fairness, you're, you're watching or listening to this show, so yeah. <laughs> I assume you maybe at least a little bit care about children's books. Um, oh yeah, that's true. Yes, <laughs> and I think uh, it's very specifically not aimed at either boys or girls. I, I want it to be as universal as possible and. Um, not to be too tied down to any one place to capture a sort of British seaside town, but 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 not be too sort of pinned down to that. So I'm hoping that, um, and I have been told it is very universal. It seems to be um, finding readers all over the place. So that's, that's, that is deliberate. I really aim for that. Um, so yeah, and hopefully, I hope it will be the book that somebody who is maybe on the verge of perhaps giving up on reading is, is given and they read it and they love it and they try another book afterwards. I mean, if it can do what um, books did for me at the age of 9, 10, 11, 12, then um, and, and encourage reading, then that would be just amazing. So I suppose I'm secretly hoping for that. And there's not uh, nearly as much uh, marching around pointlessly or long songs or any of the rest of it as in The Hobbit, so... <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it is quite a short book. I mean, it's very sort of pared down. I mean, that again was was very deliberate. I in the past I've tended to be a bit long winded with my writing, but this one I deliberately wrote it to be as 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 um, streamlined as possible. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, fifty five thousand words. So uh, that's not you know it's not a huge book, but um, I hope it feels huge to read. Well, it's certainly uh, expansive in terms of uh, all of its content, and it moves fast. Uh, in fact, I wanted to ask you about uh, the beginning of the novel, um, because the uh, second chapter uh, starts us off with extreme action. Um, uh, and, you know, there's, a, there, there's hiding and a, and, a, and, a, and a chest involved, and somebody's smashing through that chest uh, with, a, with a hook hand. Um, and uh, all, all manner of fun, just right there in the first chapter takes off, I'm sorry, the second chapter takes off running. But the first chapter, uh, it kind of gives us an overview of uh, how Cheery on the Sea uh, during the winter months becomes, I'm sorry, Cheery on Sea uh, becomes <laughs> uh, Eerie on Sea uh, during the winter months. And so I wanted to ask, um, as I think it works quite well, it, I mean, it pulled me right along uh, without stopping, but why was it important to take that first chapter uh, and introduce the overall um, set the stage for where the story is going to take place, uh, as opposed to the opening with that second chapter, which gets us right to action and conflict. I think um, when I first wrote that that opening chapter, it was a kind of um, it was a kind of preface. It was it was just something I wrote to sort of get me going, but I developed it um, and turned it into chapter one. It's only two pages long, but it's very very short. Um, because it just seemed to be a very good way to just sort of plunge the reader 
like like dipping them in a pool. You know, here's where you are now. You know, you've been wherever you've been in real life, and now you're in this story. Get ready, and then the story starts. It just seemed like a nice staging point to to draw the reader in and um, and tease the reader a little bit. I think because of course I do sort of imply that oh well, you probably shouldn't be reading this book, and then but then give them a way to sort of get around that and come in and read it anyway. And I, I just enjoyed it. It was playful, so I. I I elevated it to chapter one, and um, and it set the tone for the book. Really, once I'd written that chapter, I had written earlier versions without that chapter, um, but it just seemed once I'd written it that I, I'd arrived at the tone for the for the whole book, and so I kept it in. It's tonal, I suppose. That's the point. And I, I should clarify for your uh, esteemed audience, uh, in no way a, a complaint <laughs> or a comment on the book, because it really it was effective. It pulled me in, it set the atmosphere, and it's, it's an extremely atmospheric book throughout. And I want to ask you for some tips on that as well. Um, but um, it pulled me right in and I thought, well, this is counterintuitive to what I would do. And yet it works more effectively than what I would do. And so when that happens, that's got to be my first question is, hey, you person who's smarter than me. How do how can I do this thing better? <laughs> <laughs> I think in this in this case, um, in, in, the, in the case of Malamanda, because the whole book is narrated by one character and you never see anyone else's point of view, his his voice is 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 the central structure. And so in that case, in, 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 in a book like this, um, in a way, it's a bit easier because you just you just have to sort of build on that central central theme. If I was jumping around into into um, Violet's head here and then into Lady Kraken's head there and seeing the world from different points of view, it might not be possible to to do something like that. But because it had a s sort of simple one um, one point of view throughout the whole thing, uh, it allowed me, I think, to build more and more on that on that one point of view. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well. Um, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say really. But it just once I hit upon it, it worked really well. And I, I and again the. the the fact that the whole book is in the present tense um it's in a very immediate tense because it's just all of it narrated by herbie um and again the earlier versions were in the past tense and they were they were written as i've always written them the, th um, the third person and suddenly changing to the present and changing to uh herbie's point of view for everything that just lifted the whole book up um so i really enjoyed writing in that tense and uh uh yeah and we'll be doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, aside from uh, telling all their friends about it uh, and recommending it for everyone's Christmas list uh, and immediately heading off to Amazon and Goodreads and everywhere else and, and, and writing a glowing five-star review, oh, thank you. how yeah. are you uh, hoping that a reader coming to the story, what, what experience are you, have, are you hoping that they're going to have with this? Well, I do hope they, it's an immersive experience. I think it's... it's um, harder and harder i think to for somebody who isn't quite there with reading to have an immersive experience in a book because there's so many you know, truly visually immersive media out there there's so many other things to do and streaming tv coming out of our ears these days so i really hope that that somebody who who picks it up will be drawn in and then and then and then want to come back and come back and come back and uh, um i think that's probably if i can achieve that with just a few people that would be that would be really great so what uh, what are some things you've done specifically to try to hook those reluctant readers and keep them engaged, uh, not only through this book but through the the two coming sequels? I um, gosh, it's hard to say. I think I just uh, I worked and worked and worked at the sentences. I just I just polished it to to within an inch of destruction. I um, I just wanted it to to be to trip off the tongue. I wanted it to to read aloud as simply as possible. I cut out so many words. I mean, it, it kept streaming it down. It kept kept being uh, reduced and reduced and reduced. Um, not too many adjectives. Um, cutting down on 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 all those things that are so easy to put in when you're writing, and, and you just sort of put them in automatically because you're so used to doing it. I went through and I had my editor sort of to look and what can be cut here, what can be cut there, can I can I shave any words off here? And it felt a bit crazy to be staring at the, at the word count, but I think something I learned when I wrote picture books um, is that it it's very easy to, well, not easy, it, it's very much the case that you can do a lot more with less if you um, really um, pare things down intelligently. Um, but I'm not saying that's easy to do, because um, sometimes you just 
feel like I've torn a sentence to pieces. But um, um, you have to put yourself in the reader's perspective and you think and, and think what they need to know. And sometimes they need to know very little in order to proceed with the story. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you are looking at in, with this book. It's like a, um, a rock that's been hacked down to a pebble in a way. I mean, there's so much stuff that got to, taken out of it. Um, it really is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, as you know, when you write a book, there's a lot that you write that gets thrown to one side before you get to the end. But uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can give a more coherent answer to that. And that wasn't very coherent, was it? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mentioned the uh, book of David's about 280,000 words, give or take. Uh, and that's true, but the original draft was over 400. So just saying. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, gosh, that is a as a tome. <laughs> and I did. Uh, at, at, it, it's something that struck me is there's there's very little description, and yet I felt like I could see the characters in my mind. I felt like there was very atmospheric at times, very creepy, which I assume is intentional. So, how are you doing so much with so little actually physically there on the page? What what were the types of things you were cutting, and and what were you keeping? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, I think I cut too much. My editor did specifically ask to put things in. She said, you need to describe the characters a bit more. We haven't got enough. So, for example, um, uh, um, Mrs. Fossil, with her three hats on her head tied on with a piece of string, um, that was added in simply because my editor was worried that the characters were too thinly described. So I think um, coming at it from the point of view of, of forcing myself to add description rather than just describing everything and cutting back, that might be one tip. Um, but also, when you can use words to hint at weather without talking about the weather, for example. So you can do two things with one word almost. You, 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 if you tell somebody, that, if you tell um, the, the, the reader that the characters are warming up pebbles to put in their pockets when they go out, to walk in, in in the outside then you know what the weather is like outside without having to labor it too much um so i guess it's a just, hurricane obviously yes <laughs> <laughs> but it's just things like that I, I suppose i um i um and i know in the past that i've overwritten i mean i've this always been my problem overwriting things and too much description and i think i've just learned that Sometimes you have to just give the reader a lot to do and uh, a few a few markers, a few pointers in the text, and they can imagine the rest for themselves. I'm a great believer in um, if if you need to communicate four to the to the reader, you tell them you give them two plus two and let them work out four for themselves, rather than just telling them four. Do you see what I mean? It, it it's to give them a little more to do. Um, hooks them in. I mean, a reading isn't as passive as I think people sometimes believe it is. A good book is a book people are engaging with more actively than that. And one way is let, let them imagine a bit by setting the parameters and the, the tone and then not just giving them all, all the description that goes with it. Does that, does that make sense? It absolutely does. And two plus two, but not four, is something that my critique group parrots to me on a regular basis. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, which usually means that, Kent, we're smart enough to understand the novel. You don't have to explain all of this, all of this. Which is why, yeah. which is why they're my good friends, and, and they're to help and save me from and myself. We all, we all need someone like that. We definitely do. And there's something uh, that I wanted to ask you about since you mentioned Pebbles on the Beach. Uh, as I'd read that you'd said that Malamander is in many ways the culmination of an ongoing project to turn beachcombing into books, uh, which I love. But I, I wonder, what, what what does that mean? How so? Well, I um, when I first came to live in the seaside town I live in now, um, I began walking on the beach every day. I, I discovered beachcombing um and discover the amazing things that you can find. And for a while, I had a, a Facebook page and uh, even a, an Instagram account where I would take the things that I found and then I would present them as something that they weren't, but something which I imagined that they might be. So I, it was a way into sort of legends and stories and it grew quite big. And I, 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 I stopped doing it really because once I started turning, to give an example, I would find a piece of... Um, um, sea glass for example that happened to be a funny shape but rather than say look at this lovely piece of sea glass i found i would say well this is the the, the heart of uh, a sea imp or something i mean it was a bit more um thought thoughtful than that but it grew quite big and i just enjoyed turning um 
these strange things into legends and stories and really that's that this developed into Malamanda um, because it felt like I was putting a lot of creative thought into something quite sort of marginal why not turn that into a story and so um, beachcombing is quite at the heart of why I started writing it really and where I live I can find amber and uh, fossilized bones and uh, I mean these things take some finding but when when you found those things even even if you're not making up what what they are the the reality of what they are is pretty fascinating. So um, I do feel like I was inspired by by walking on the beach every day in all weathers. And, and weather is an important part of the book too. And of course, weather is is a, a big part of, the, of living by the sea. It's, it's different every day, especially in England. <laughs> so I think that's what all I meant. It was it was a sort of throwaway line, but uh, I um, I did want to turn beach going into books and kind of feel like I've succeeded. <laughs> You mentioned earlier, without without spoiling, uh, that the the cat happened and it, the thing with the cat happened, and it just felt right. <laughs> um, do you find that stories are are like found objects that you're discovering that are intact, uh, more or less, as you're finding them, or are you creating the thing? How, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I think I, um, I think it's Stephen King, isn't it, who describes writing as like archaeology or paleontology that. That the, the skilled writer is, is 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 uncovering a fossil from within the rock that was yes. before it's there, and um, I've always been struck by that. I think that's that's it, if a book feels right, and it does feel like it's always been there. The story does feel like it's always existed. It does feel like you've uncovered it, and it's come from somewhere else. Um, so when I when I'm writing it, it's not going very well. I certainly feel like I'm I'm building it, and. That's um, not always a good feeling, <laughs> but when it feels right and something happens that that, that kind of comes to me on, in the moment and, and it's just the right thing, then that does, yeah, it does very much feel like I've uncovered something that was always there. And again, that's like beach in a way. You 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 step along and you you look down and there's something and and suddenly it's a, it's a stone and now it's not. It's a it's a thing that you have in your hand that's amazing that you know maybe you'll keep all your life and pass down to your children or. Um, um, so yeah, I guess I like the analogy. So when it's going well, I'll go with the analogy. But when it's not, I think um, it does feel like I'm making a big mess of my own. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I love t chatting with authors, uh, because to non-writers, this sounds like, whoa, get back to the flying <laughs> saucers and the ghosts. This is woo-woo stuff. But when you talk to somebody who, who's there, who's doing it, <laughs> I find writers yeah. commonly tell me, yes, don't, that's my experience. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, with my dog, who's uh, determined to be in this podcast. <laughs> we like pet guest stars. <laughs> What's your dog's name? His name's Alpha, and he's uh, he's a big part of the beachcombing experience because I have to walk him. He's very energetic, and so he forces me out every day, even in the rain. Um, so uh, he's really my, I call him my lead researcher, which is a joke that might not work so well in the US because, of course, you say leash, but we say lead, and so lead researcher has <laughs> <what> meaning. <laughs> Yep, don't see my slow American brain caught on to the joke when she explains it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I wanted um, I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, being an artist uh, as well as an author, because you've got a fabulous map here uh, at the uh, start of the book. Uh, and so I wanted to ask, is this, uh, did you draw this map before you started the book, during, or was this after? Um, the map, I had a rough sketch while I was writing the book, but I actually finalised it afterwards um, to allow myself to um, really just settle the text before I settled the the, uh, the map, just in case I wanted to change anything. Um, so, in fact, the map is the only piece of artwork of mine in, in the US edition. It's um, um, All the rest of it was uh, illustrated by Tom Booth, who's done a really brilliant and beautiful job of, sort of bringing alive this, bringing alive this world that I uh, that I created. But the map is is um, is yeah, that's the same map as in the UK edition. Um, but yes, I was changing the map right up to the last minute. Well, I'm, until I was sure the text was right, I was still fiddling with things on the map and trying to decide if I should add more street names or not. And you said you're about. Um, midway through book two at this point? Um, I've almost finished it. It's pretty much finished um, book two. In fact, I'm building up starting book three, which uh, I have to start doing um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, really, this month I want to get down to it. I've started planning it. I've had I've been thinking about it for a long time. But book two, I'm just finishing up some line edit queries and making some last minute changes, and then the text should be there. I wanted to ask that just because I was curious if the uh, having drawn the map already and published the map, if that's been obnoxious to you, or did you pretty <laughs> much know how the uh, have you locked yourself in anything, or did you know what was going to happen more or less with the sequels before you started on them? I had a rough idea, uh, yeah. and I did put things in the map that I felt were going to be relevant later. Whether or not that will quite work out, I'm not quite sure, because the second book has changed quite a lot. Um, and sometimes I felt a little bit locked in, but I think you just have to you just have to work with it. You set up your own limitations in a way, but you have to you have to build on it. It's part of the challenge of writing a series rather than standalone. Um, there will be a second map in book two, a map of the whole bay, because Erie, um, Erie Bay has its own um, topography that plays into the story of the second book, some of which takes place on, on, on a boat at sea. So uh, there'll, be a, there'll be two maps in the second book. Gotcha. So if you move the characters, then the first map is, is fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's okay. And I also have left, I deliberately left some street names blank, just in case... I wanted to slip in a new street name or or adapt it a little bit to my to my needs later on. Um, it is a bit cheaty, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are these are golden tips for authors. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do too much in the first book. That's the <laughs> <laughs> Just leave open possibilities. Did you uh, do you do you draw a lot as you're uh, writing your fiction? Do you design your characters anything like that? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I when I'm. Um, planning the novel or I'm making notes, I'd often sketch little things, um, especially if it's a bit uncertain that I want to, to get it clear what it looks like in my in my head. Sometimes I get a very clear image in my head. I do often start with, with the way things look with an image in my head, but sometimes it's quite hard to get my head around some of the more complicated things. So yeah, my, my notebooks do have sketches in them. Um, but the planning stage, I mean, really, it's quite scruffy for me. I mean, I, I, I have... Um, notebooks full of scribbles and sketches uh, and then I can never take it beyond um, beyond that to a coherent plan I can only really plan about half the book and then I have to sort of wing the rest and when I'm doing that I, I can't afford to sketch really I'm too busy wrangling with the words but uh, um, I usually start with drawings certainly at some at some level and you uh, have done comics as well uh, and you know, of course picture books so I'm always curious when I'm talking to somebody who's who's multi-talented, because uh, as I mentioned, uh, despite being uh, relatively creatively successful uh, as an author, I cannot sing, uh, and I also can barely draw. Uh, and so when I when I talk to somebody who ambidextrous isn't the right word, but whatever the word would be uh, for being able to both um, objectively uh, write and draw equally well, do you feel like you do both equally well? Um. Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, I, I these days I tend to feel more like a writer who who draws rather than a, an artist who also writes. So I have flipped over at some point, um, and um, I never wanted to illustrate Malamanda uh, fully. I was always happy to just do the sort of decorative elements. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I've I've shifted over to a position where where I, I write the book and then the the illustration part is like a small additional project that comes later on. Whereas I know in the US uh, the publishers there it's the same publisher but it's a different um, you know I have a different editor and it's a different they have a different market. Obviously the US market's different. They very much wanted a very f a fully richly illustrated book. So. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so it's quite different. I mean, it looks very different. The style, Tom Booth's style, lends itself really well. But I mean, it's it's oh, um, sorry about my dog. It lends itself really well, but um, um, uh, the overall effect is very different. But I think it's very effective. Um, Tom's drawings are great. I haven't actually met him yet. So I'm hoping to to meet him at some point. But uh, um, uh, I really love his drawings. I mean, he's he's uh, it's funny when you see someone else draw something you've imagined. Um, can be quite a funny experience to see someone's imagining of your own imagining. Um, I'm not, well, used not to just uh, imagine, but, but this is a book that you it's not illustrated in the UK version, but more of your artwork is featured throughout, correct? Yes, every chapter heading has a little drawing. Um, 
and that little drawing is really meant to be more decorative than illustrative. So I didn't really want to draw any of the characters. And I didn't want to draw the Malamander. Um, and I didn't want to, I wanted to leave as much as possible to the reader's imagination. Um, whereas obviously in the US, the, 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 the thrust is very much to produce a very beautiful book with, with very rich illustrations. And so um, uh, all those things are drawn. Uh, uh, but it's very effective. I think it works really well. So um, there are two different approaches, and I think they're both equally valid. Um, it's just a sign of how different the uh, market is in the US to the UK, I think. Because the books are noticeably, they are very different. Even the covers are very different. Uh, commit itself to the fun experience of uh, those esteemed readers uh, who find uh, Malamander here in the US or vice versa, and they love it, uh, and they wish they could read it again, but slightly different. Well, good news. <laughs> yes, well, yes. yes, there's a possibility. <laughs> yes, and there are small, there are small changes in the text as well. I mean, the, not just the spellings and a few vocabulary changes. There are a few moments where um, I was specifically asked, "Could we just change this?" Because for the U.S. market, it won't quite work. Or so there are small changes. It might be fun for someone to go through and spot them. Things like lead versus leash are more substantial than that. A bit. Well, not, I don't know if it's anything really substantial, but. Um, um, for example, one of the objects that um, uh, Violet finds on top of the wardrobe, and she finds those few scrappy objects on the wardrobe, is a Pokemon card. And I quite like to mentioning if you, I like to mention things that anchor the book in the real world, so it's not completely divorced from the real world. And just little little moments like that. So a reader, you know, twelve year old reader reading it will 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 see something they recognise. But in the US, my my editor said, um, actually, we we'd rather not have that because we, we we don't want you know we, we'd like to keep it um a completely immersive experience so it's been changed to playing card the pokemon card has become a playing card in the us it's a very small subtle change i was quite happy to make it but it does yeah it brings a slightly different experience to that that scene i think um mm. and i can't say which i prefer to be honest um it gets quite difficult when you in the at the stage of checking through um a book that's being adapted for the uh, the US market from my UK perspective, sometimes it can go either way. I mean, really don't mind one way or the other, but um, sometimes it's quite a big thing. You have to sort of get it just right. Because um, I suppose if you're, if you're an American reader reading a book and something just seems wrong, then it takes you out of the story. So it's an important thing to get right. I suppose. I mean, occasionally when I, you know, when I read books by uh, English authors or, or or other international authors and the spelling's a little bit different, that'll throw me off a little bit. But at the moment, my brain clicks. I'm like, OK, for the remainder of this book, that's how it's going to be. It's not an issue. OK. Um, okay. Yes, after the first time. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm with you. I, I, I don't suppose it makes a huge difference. Um, but I like it when I read a, a, a fun, fantastical book and they're drinking a Pepsi or there's something that uh, that anchors it to our world. Like, oh, OK, they're like me. They have Pokemon, too. Yeah. Yeah. But whatever that's worth. Um, U.S. editor, if you're listening, by God, put that Pokemon card back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a bit late for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I think the train might have left the station. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then I wanted to ask you, because there, like I said, this, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to call this uh, a horror novel, um, but there are some very creepy moments. And the Malamander, of course, is, is, is quite a creepy fellow. Um, so what uh, what tips do you have for writing about monsters and ghosts and scary things for younger readers without ever crossing that line of becoming being so scary that that, that uh, the editor says, no, we're, we're not we're not giving this to children? Yeah, that's a tricky one, because um, I think I might have stepped over the line a little bit with the early draft, and uh, there was a little bit, there was more blood in the book, <laughs> and I was asked to tone that down, um, and was happy to, but... Um, Disagree uh, again, more blood, more Pokemon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, this was in the UK, the UK editor asked me to, redu to reduce the amount of gore, there wasn't a huge amount, but it just, um, I... Um, yeah, it's a hard one to get right, and of course, Manamander is is um, it is intended to be creepy, and it is a little bit in its tone. It is like a horror a horror story, but toned down for a readership. But there are some children who've been quite, um, I think, frightened in a good way. I mean, I've had people say, oh, "I was scared, but I had to keep reading," and I, in the end, I really loved it because I, I just had to make sure that it wasn't ever 
too dark and never stepped over that line. And I think in the end, it, it when you get to the end, you you realise it's um, well, I won't spoil anything, but uh, um, it is difficult. But I use a lot of humour as well. I tried to bring a lot of humour into the book. So um, Her Herbie, whatever else is happening, Herbie tends to bring a note of, of fun, which I think lightens the the, uh, the tone and adds a kind of contrast that I think is quite useful. So having a contrast might be a good tip for people who who want to bring a little of that horror feel but don't want to go too far. Uh, you can balance it up with some fun and, and maybe uh, solve it that way. Well, it also uh, increases the effectiveness of the horror because you get the uh, the fun and the humor and that kind of calms you and you're like, oh, this is a, I'm in a safe place. This is a safe story. That oh oh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely wanted a few un under the under the covers moments, you know, for for the for the reader um, without it being too much. So uh, I'm pretty pleased with how it came out. I have to say, I I, um, um, I think I've got the right tone there, but I think in the past i haven't always got that quite right but uh, i think it's worked in malamanda i always thought that uh, not just because of the classic example of brawl doll uh, but that uh, horror and children's fiction are natural bed bedfellows of course i would think that because i write both <laughs> Um, but uh, just because when you're dealing with something, I, I, I like really imaginative stories. Uh, and of course, when you're writing a really imaginative story, a, an imagination that uh, can provide you with wonderful dreams uh, during the day, once it gets uh, past a certain time at night and everybody's asleep and it's dark, that same imagination can sometimes turn on you a little bit. Uh, and so... I don't know where I'm going with that other than I like monsters and I know that you write about ghosts and, and, and monsters and, um, mm -hmm. and vampires and, and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, do you, I don't know, do you ever see yourself writing aside from like a picture book? Do you see yourself writing like a, um, um, just a straightforward narrative, no ghost, no, uh, like a, like a Howard's end, uh, type story. Oh, with, God. Uh, with nothing beyond. I, um, you know, I think I'd find that quite hard. <laughs> I think I'd find it quite difficult, but I, possibly. But I'm not drawn to 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 do that. I like to. It's true. I do like to bring the paranormal or supernatural in if I can. Um, um, without trying, it just seems to appear. But uh, um, I could probably write a historical mystery where nothing supernatural happened. But. Um, I wouldn't write a I wouldn't write a comedy of manners set in a cafe in you know a big city and just just deal with everyone's lives. I think I would I would lose interest if I tried to do that. I certainly wouldn't do it for children. Well, writing a historical novel that's where you can get really crazy because yeah. <laughs> previous times, uh, especially when when everybody that uh, covered things up is dead and, and they're no longer worried about um, uh, political concerns, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not going to upset such and such a king. Uh, it's not a problem. Um, but with history, uh, you mankind, the, the history of mankind is just nasty. You can find all kinds of great scary stuff yeah, without uh, need of a monster. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, the first book I tried to write was about pirates. I mean, just that is just the history of piracy is uh, fascinating. I didn't have any, any monsters in that, but that was certainly a very rich theme to, uh, to mine for fiction. Unfortunately, everybody else had already mined it, and there were lots of pirate books out at that time, so uh, I didn't get anywhere with it. But uh, yeah, there are certainly periods of history that would be interesting to write about. So now you've got a, a manuscript that's uh, on a shelf someplace that as soon as pirate Pirates begin trending again. Uh, <laughs> blow the dust off that thing and get it ready. <laughs> Quite possible. Yeah, I've got a couple. I've got a couple. How do you, uh, and I'm, I'm asking everybody this because I'm still trying to figure it out myself. How do you make peace with those manuscripts um, that are for the shelf, that, that aren't going to be widely consumed? I think the first one, the one I just mentioned, the pirate story, I think um, I, that was a test. That was me testing if I could write longer form fiction. And even though there's a lot of merit in it, I, I tend to mine it quietly in the background for, for later fiction and take the things that worked out and recycle them. I don't really think it'll ever see the light of day. But I have sub subsequently written a novel that, um, uh, which I think has got some merit, but which I couldn't find a publisher for. So um, I, I'm, one day I, I might try and self-publish that, just for the experience of seeing how that works. Um, 
Uh, so that one's very much a kind of back burner. We'll see, we'll see, but I haven't given up on it yet. Whereas the other one is one I, I have no aspirations for really, but uh, um, it was a good place to, to practice starting to learn to write. Yeah, I've heard that other authors have that problem. Everything I've ever written has been perfect, so it, it, it's not been a concern. <laughs> but <if> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you, uh, <laughs> you mentioned self-publishing. Do you, do you have aspirations to eventually self-publish, and what would that allow you to do that traditional publishing wouldn't? Um, to be honest, not really. It's just that when I I um, think about that particular text, I I just think. Um, that might be the route for it, and I'm just curious about self-publishing. Really, I'd like to try to try it just to see see how it is. Really, to see how um, I mean, I would still need to bring in an editor. I think you can't really do the whole thing completely on your own. I don't think you need that 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 critique group. You need those other voices and and, and uh, opinions. But in terms of actually putting it out there, I'm just curious about the whole process really and see how how it might work. So it's, it's a. I'm not planning to do it soon. It's just an idea that I can't quite can't quite get rid of. So uh, at some point, I think I'll do it. It's kind of a fun thing that I find that uh, when I talk to traditionally published authors, sometimes they have indie author envy, uh, and then I'll talk to indie uh, authors, and they have <laughs> traditionally published author envy. Uh, and then even if you talk to two traditionally published authors, somebody's usually envious of somebody else. For some yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, oh, what did I want to? Oh, I, I know, and you're right. Uh, self publishing is a term that I'm trying to move away from because it, when it's done right, uh, it's not it's not self publishing. It's it's an indie project. You're essentially building your own little publishing house because you're going to bring in an editor. You may bring in a book designer. You may want to bring in a publicist. All sorts of people to to do things that you yourself may or may not be as effective at. Although. Um, since we've established that you're whatever the word is for ambidext ambidextrous around <laughs> art and, and fiction, you may invel uh, you may in fact be good at all those things. I don't. Can you sing as well? <laughs> uh, I can't, certainly can't sing. I certainly wouldn't be good at all those things. And I think you're right. Yes, I mean the term self-publishing maybe is a bit dated now. Um, um, yeah, but I do admire. I mean, there are people I know people who who who, who do quite well at it and. Um, I think they uh, they enjoy the freedom it brings. So, um, um, well, I'll watch this space, but perhaps I'll never do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I wanted to ask you just a little bit about uh, Scarlet Heart, which I know is something that's coming up. Uh, what can you tell us about it at this point? Oh, well, it's actually published. It, it was oh, it published, um, yeah, last year, in fact. Um, it's my uh, collaboration with the author Marcus Sedgwick, um, I've known Marcus for years and we've always talked about doing a comic book together and uh, some years back we decided we'd try and do it and so we came up with this this scenario about a teenage girl or young teen who fights monsters and it's set in a, an alternative 1920s world that's a little bit mid-Atlantic so you can't quite tell if you're in England or you're in New England it's somewhere in between and um, uh, she, uh, her parents are missing, so she's got to take on the monster hunting project on her own. It's a monster hunting business. But she's too young to do it. The whole thing's regulated by this academy that that um, is after her all the time because she's breaking the rules. And so it's her and her butler and their their big sports car and um, all sorts of gadgets that she's inherited from her parents. And they go out hunting monsters. And it was good fun because I mean I, I did all the drawing in it. It was um, um, Marcus wrote it and I drew it, and it was. Uh, a bit of an ambition to to create something like that. I've always loved Tintin, so it's got a little Tintin feel about it. And um, yeah, just really enjoyed doing it. It just took a long, long time though. It took far too long. Um, How long? It took a couple of years, uh, and I I think it took too long. I mean, I would probably do it a bit differently now, but um, uh, I'd never done a comic book quite like that. So it was it was a there was a sharp learning curve. Um, yeah, it just took too long, but I, I enjoyed doing it. And uh, um, um, yeah, you know, Marcus Edrick are, are are still friends at this point. Oh yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, no, we didn't fall out over it at all. Actually, it was good. We we did it all via um, telephone conversations because he lives in France, so we we couldn't always meet up, but we uh, occasionally did, and we we managed to do it um, over the time and. Uh, 
it was quite a rewarding experience to work with someone like Marcus. I mean, he's very successful, very well established. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good experience. So with a collaboration like that, are the roles clearly defined where he says, I'm going to be handling all of the writing and all of the story and you'll you'll do just the art? Or is it a little bit more back and forth like that? Do you find yourself revising some things he'd written? I, we, well, we did, to start with, we created it together. The scenario is kind of created together. There came a point where we had to start actually making the final content. At that point, we separated and he he very much wrote it. And I worked on the art, but he was still free to comment on the art um, and make suggestions. And equally, I made suggestions back about the writing. I didn't really change any of the writing, except occasionally when I was drawing, it suddenly seemed that a different phrase, maybe, or probably more likely just a, a sound or an exclamation might be quite useful there, or a little bit more dialogue in that space because there's nothing going on. So occasionally I would suggest a short phrase or two um, or for someone to shout. Um, wow or something but uh, I didn't really make any substantial change to his writing and it was good because he wrote he wrote the whole thing like a film script so it came to me like uh, uh, presented properly like a film script so I then had to almost like a movie maker create um, the storyboard except in my case it would only ever be a storyboard it would never go beyond to uh, to be filmed but um, it was fun to work on on a script format like that and how uh, how does your process change from project to project? Because you're you're doing a little bit of everything. I, I imagine it's, it's it's pretty much strictly Malamander at the moment, um, and, and and in that world. Um, but between writing middle grade picture books, comics, do you keep yes. a similar routine for all of those? How how does your process change? Uh, I um, I mean, obviously, I have to be good at self motivation, <laughs> and I find that quite difficult. But I find it somehow it's easier to sit down and draw than to sit down and start writing. I find myself far more of a procrastinator when it comes to writing, so I do have to force myself a bit more. Um, and there's another big change that is quite significant, actually. I I, yeah, I love podcasts. I love audio content. I love listening to audio books and. When I'm drawing, I have a continuous stream of radio or podcast or um, audio book or whatever it may be, audio content of all kinds of music. But when I'm writing, I have to have complete silence. And so uh, if I switch between a, a mostly writing project to a mostly drawing project, it seems to have a knock-on effect the rest of my life. So, for example, if, um, if I go the other way and I've got used to listening to, to a series of um, podcasts and, and um, audio books, um, during a drawing project, when I switch to writing and I'm writing all day, I miss all those things. And so when I'm walking the dog, I've got the headphones in and I'm catching up, scrambling to catch up. Um, so there are little things like that. It's quite different. Um, and also I need more room on drawing. I need, uh, I, need uh, I need to get the drawing board out, but my, 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 my desk comes up, it folds up, becomes a, a light box and I have um, papers everywhere. It takes up a lot more room. And then when I'm writing, I'm just here at the, the screen or I'm, I'll take my laptop to um, the cafe or something. So um, there are these kind of um, very basic differences that affect the way I work. Um, but a lot of it is pretty seats of the pants stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm a real pantster when it comes to uh, rather than a plotter. Um, I do wish I could plan a bit more, but uh, it's quite tricky. I don't know about you. How are you? How are, you? are you a planner or a Oh, everybody's somewhere on the spectrum. I'm a little bit closer to plotter than pantser because I like to play like I'm doing chess where I usually know at least a couple of moves ahead. And I, I almost always know, give or take, what ending I'm shooting for. Then I let the characters decide whether or not they can talk me out of it, which occasionally they do. <laughs> there, were, there were a couple that I planned to kill that <laughs> okay. talked me out of it. Okay, uh, wow. And then there were a few that I, I was sure would make it and that he didn't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's obviously what I'm uh, writing for older readers. Yeah. Uh, so I like to have what I call a grocery list. Like if I'm going to the store, I, I wouldn't go so far as to like draw myself a map of here's the aisle that you're going to go to and you're going to get the items in this order. But I'd still have more or less a list of things I want to pick up while I'm there. And maybe a couple of other and then while I'm out, I'm like, well, I'm this close to this such and such a store. And I find that kind of a similar process to writing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'm here in the plot, but while I'm here, wouldn't it be fun to do this and this? Mm. 
yeah, I think you need to have the bare bones, don't you? But you also need the the, the capacity to change direction or bring something surprising in or, or allow yourself to make a change. So I think it's good to be a bit of both. I just think I need to get the balance a bit more over to where you seem to be, where a bit more planned. <laughs> Well, and we've already agreed that stories are found objects, so theoretically, uh, true, true. <laughs> you can do it either way, and you'll you'll come to it, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but I do find if I give in to that too much, I, I never write like a first line of anything without some idea where I'm headed. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't have to know the whole thing. And in fact, uh, the one time I did sit down and I wrote out a, a twenty-page outline with detailed uh, steps, I never wrote that novel. I, I already okay. had the outline. I knew what was going to happen. Hmm. Put that away. Next project. Um, right. So I like to wow. have the, the joy of discovery a little bit as I'm going, but just yeah. with some planning involved. Mm. Yeah, no, I think you're right. The other thing I'm a big fan of is if I can get uh, just small, smaller chunks or maybe a first half to my writing group um, ahead of time, because I know they're going to tear me apart anyway. And if they tear <laughs> me apart in the middle of the story, as opposed to after I've already written the thing, after I've already written the thing, I fall into despair. I'm like, no, I did it. It's, it's beautiful. Why would you tear it up so badly? But if you tell me in the middle where there's still a chance for me to reconfigure some things and, and get it where I want it still by the end, mm -hmm. I just find that that's a more pleasant process. Yes, yeah, I think that sounds right. If pleasant can ever be a word used to describe to sit down and hear your friends talk about your <laughs> fictional shortcomings. Yeah, no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> And do you keep uh, specific hours? What does your writing day look like? Um, I um, I prefer to work. I think my ideal time to work would be early afternoon through into the evening. But since I became a father, I haven't been able to, to do that. So with the school day and everything, I'm, I'm forced to work mornings. So I do have to um, get children to school, get the dog walked. <laughs> <laughs> and then try to be at least sitting at my desk by about 10 a.m. Um, and try and work from there. And then if I can possibly work beyond 3 p.m. when the children will be imminently arriving home, then uh, I, I will, but usually I have to stop around then. So, um, so my working day is squashed into this sort of uh, six-hour period in the middle. But I think with writing, it's a mistake to try and work too much for too long. It's good to have a quite a short period where you're quite intense uh, about, about it and then um, not try and write too much because in the past I've, I've worked all day and written 7,000 words and thought myself I've been really clever and then got up the next day back to my desk to read those 7,000 words and they're pretty awful whereas if I'd written <laughs> 2,000 maybe I'd have I'd have got something better and they needed a bit less uh, um, editing so uh, I try not to work if I'm writing anyway if I'm drawing I have to work long hours I will but from writing I try to make it um relatively short period that I am actually writing um unless you're at that stage and I'm sure you know this where you just you just can't stop because you've you've got to get the next bit you've got to get the next bit that wonderful moment they call flow I think where you just you have to be there and uh, everyone wants to get there but um that's quite rare <laughs> those wonderful moments where it seems to be almost writing itself as the the top experience of being a writer i think but uh, few and far between and then i turned to myself and like what the heck was the wrong with the rest of your week why wasn't it all like this yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and then when i when i have a great day and i'm starting to plan out when is this actually going to be done and i said well if every day is just like today then i got next week <laughs> yeah yes then the next day is never as good do you know a lot, of, a lot of up and down unfortunately yeah. uh, do you have I'm, I'm fascinated by author rituals do you have little things that you do like uh, I, I call it the passing of a, a gold watch like a hypnotist where you're you're self-hypnotizing getting yourself into the story world do you have little things that you have to do before you start writing um not really but when um when it's i have a scarf that i like to wear if if it's not hot so at the moment i haven't been wearing it for a while because it's the summer but um, my grandmother knitted me i think i mentioned she's a librarian she knitted me a doctor who style scarf when i was about 17 i think this is tom baker doctor who so you know going back a bit and i've still got it and um i like to wear it when i'm writing i like to put it around especially if I'm not sure what I'm doing. And I, I don't actively think of my grandmother every time I wear it, I don't think, but I, 
I just find it helps me to to get into the writing mood because I've become used to doing it, I suppose. But uh, um, I don't have to have it to write, but I quite like having it. So that that becomes, especially in the winter, that becomes quite a, a regular um, feature of my writing day because it's very long. So I can wrap it around my head. So I, sometimes I'm barely looking out. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> not sure if that counts, but. Uh, no, absolutely. I've actually got uh, Sam grand- grandmother who who saw the flying saucer, um, uh, bought me an ET blanket when I was uh, a kid. There was this big auction uh, that we went to, and everyone was you know it was a state auction. And I stood by this ET blanket for I think three or four hours. Uh, and my parents' uh, money was a little bit tight, so they said, "No, just leave it. You have ET things at home." Uh, but my grandmother, after I'd left, went and, and got it for me. Uh, and oh, so I, wow. I still have it, and I keep it in my reading chair. So when I'm reading, I like to I like to have it there. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's nice to have things like that. I think um, writers are like sailors. I think they become very superstitious about things as well. And um, nice to have the, the the right pen and the right pencil and the the right conditions to sit down to write. Or maybe those are excuses that uh, you just can't get those things together. That's a good reason not to do any work that day. But uh... <laughs> it's probably more true than not. <laughs> My wife suggested that I've been writing on the same desk since I was sixteen, fifteen, mm-hmm. uh, and it's you know it's looking a little little old down. Uh, she pointed out, you know, there are furniture stores here. We we could afford to get you a nicer desk, and I'm just scandalized. Like, no, how would I ever write <laughs> on a different desk? <laughs> you yeah, tried yeah, to, yeah. to ruin my entire writing career? Goodness. <laughs> yeah. So I'm uh, watching the clock go by, and I know I've got to wrap this up soon to go get uh, a very hungry child off a bus so he can That's walk on everything in our, our kitchen. Um, so let me ask you this for all the questions that I haven't thought to, to ask you. If there was something that one thing, two things, a little bit of wisdom. If you could go back and tell yourself at the start of your career, um, other than hang on to that Harry Potter manuscript, because that's going to be worth <laughs> um, If there was something you could go back and, and tell a younger version of you that would have made your writing journey better, what would that thing be? I think I should have um, started earlier. And I think that I uh, would go back and tell myself to be brave and start because I, there was a long time i think when it occurred to me that i liked creating stories in my head and um um but i was a bit nervous about starting to try and write because i think i was worried i wouldn't be able to and i would be a, be a big a big disappointment i think i should have been braver and just started earlier um whether or not that's helpful to anybody else i don't know but that's what i should have told myself i think Oh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Writing takes courage. Uh, and spoiler, we're we're all going to die anyway. So yes, <laughs> yeah. so, well, so far, I'm still holding out hope for myself. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> but so far, that that seems to be the trend. Uh, so you might yes, as well yes. do the thing that you you want to do, right? Yeah, definitely. definitely. And then we'll have a very different conversation because at that point, we'll know whether or not they're a ghost, presumably. Right? Well, absolutely. <laughs> Come back and talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do an afterlife podcast. <laughs> It'll yeah. be the sensation of the uh, of the afterlife. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess where uh, can uh, esteemed audience find out more about you online and purchase your books and stock you and and learn more? Um, I'm on Twitter um, at uh, Thomas H Taylor, and I'm probably most easily reachable through that or through my website. Um, Thomas Taylor author.com, um, where you can send me an email or, or read some of my um, previous posts about myself. I've got a Facebook page, which you can probably find by searching. Um, there is an Erie on Sea website, but it's geared up primarily, I think, for the UK um, because all the um, graphics obviously feature the uh, UK edition. But you can look up erieonsea.com and find uh, a fun little website with lots going on. And there's a bit more about me on there as well. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm out there. You can find me. 
And as ever, esteemed audience, you can find out more about me and more about what's going on with the show at middlegradeninja.com. Uh, make sure you find your way back here. I don't say days anymore because I'm always wrong on what day the show <laughs> will air. Uh, but in the near future, uh, find your way back here for Annie Sullivan, uh, Claire McKinney, John Claude Bemis, all kinds of great stuff coming your way. Uh, Thomas, I've been asking our guests to sign us off with the uh, very ninja-like, totally justifies the name of the show phrase, hi ya and what have you. Will you sign us off? hi Do I have to say what have you as well? I didn't quite get that. I, it's up to you. <laughs> hi What have you? Beautiful. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs>